Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, we're very happy to have Bob Ellis talking about his new book, And So It Went. He had a stroke of luck with the opening of the book. It opens the morning after the last federal election, when Bob had been at his son's wedding and stayed the night in, in the park at Kirribilli and stayed the night um, over in a hotel in Kirribilli. Something made him get up early in the morning. He went out on the street looking for breakfast and he ended up outside Kirribilli House. And the media was gathered and the still Prime Minister, John Howard, came out for his morning work, walk. How do you get a stroke of luck like that? No, no. Oh, yeah, I, have a, I have a gift for it. I'm, I, don't know. <laughs> I went down to uh, launch a film about Chifley in Canberra on the night that uh, Brendan Nelson called on the challenge and Turnbull won, so I stayed an extra few hours. It happens like that. And of course, that enables <clears throat> you to say, uh, this is the, um, the page and a half that introduces the book, uh, describing... Well, why don't you read it? Describing Foot this point. bit here about, about Howard noticing you and walking on briskly. He walked on briskly. He saw me and continued past me. How game he is, I thought. <laughs> in silence, he bustled on and I followed him. The media people ran ahead of him, turned and encircled him, snapping and flashing. The unrepeatable moment, the dawn of a new era. His pace increased, his gait reminiscent of a soldier crab. I kept up dogging him, puffing. He knew I was there. Soon he got ahead of me. I walked more slowly, afraid I might fall down in a heap. This is why he outlived everybody, I thought. <laughs> He doesn't let up. He got ahead of me and went down the hill to the park under the bridge. He dwindled into insect size with a swarm of insects around him, snapping and circling in unceasing ambush on the grass by the water across from the opera house. Soon he was very tiny, with very tiny assailants all around him, the glittering water and the passing ferries behind him, the bridge arching over him. What a good way, I thought, to end the book. That's how the book starts. <laughs> How do you describe this kind of book? It's, it's like a journal, a journal of things that, that happened as the Howard government was defeated and Obama won and, and Rudd won and the politics. And its other feature is that you're inserted as a character yes. in the book. Um, and there's, along with the political events, you're giving an account of a lot of cultural clutter. Yes. Uh, the plays you saw, the books you happen to be reading on the bus going, mm. going back to uh, the Palm Beach. So, um, the sort of book it is, does it owe, I'm just driven to ask, does it owe a lot to Norman Mailer, for example? When you were a student at Sydney University, would you have been impressed by Norman Mailer and thought, I want to write accounts of history like that, armies of the night and the other things? Exactly, you have me. I even went so far as to refer to myself in the third person until 1980 when my wife told me to stop. Yeah. <laughs> it, it could be a sign of madness. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, that's right. Politicians, when they say, uh, uh, when, when you, you're, you're... Well, Richard Nixon was... Say, you know, was you ask what Richard Nixon says. Richard Nixon says, you know, that, that is the mm. first sign of, as you know. Uh, I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, comrade, not yet. <laughs> so, would it be, the, the way you've got all that clutter there, what I call the cultural clutter, um, alongside the account of political events, I mean, is that... Is that uh, all out of Norman Mailer and the new journalism? Is the new journalism part of that? It owes a... Hunter um, is Thompson, I'm thinking of. Oh, yes, uh, but it owes a little to Gore Vidal's wonderful memoir, Palimpsest, in which he drifted between present events and past events and uh, conversations he was having now and conversations he remembered from 30 years ago. I think it's, it's a wonderful form. And uh, as you correctly noted in your book there, at, uh, in your note on the back of the book at... Uh, it resembles Tolstoy, in which... Uh, <laughs> and he thought which, politicians referring to themselves in the third person was a sign of madness. <laughs> and Tol Tolstoy inserts minor characters into great public events, you know, and uh, I, I'm so, happy to be that one. So the new journalism, yes. Hunter S. Thompson, uh, Norman Mailer's work, mm. um, would, would a, a contemporary critic say there's a bit that's... Um, that's uh, postmodernist about the way everything's jumbled together. Possibly, if I knew what postmodernist was. <laughs> but uh, 
It seems to me that uh, you cannot apprehend history intensely unless you have a pair of eyes with which to do it. There is the, the lofty Peter Harcher way of being, Peter Harcher way of being 300 feet above the events, frowning slightly. <laughs> that I do not uh, like. I think it's, it's crazy to imagine that the reporter does not have feelings and reactions. And that's what you capture, your instincts yes. throughout all of, the, all of the events you describe. There's... I don't think there will ever be a better description of Kim Beasley than the one you give. And I told you I yes. wanted you to read it if you've, yes. if you've found it. It's, it's the one where you encounter Beasley in Parliament House after he's been replaced as leader and you have a conversation with him in the, the parliamentary dining room. You might, you might take us through yes. that. Yes. Tuesday, 27th of March, 2007, 11.25pm. Drove to Canberra and entered in good order the leader of the opposition, Kevin Rudd's office. His young minder, Tim Dixon, greeted me cheerfully and we talked eventually. He said, have you seen Kim? No, I said, I don't much feel like, you know, invading his misery, witnessing it. No, no, come on, he's fine. Come on, I'll take you around. And he took me around long corridors to see him. I was expecting a warm puddle of grief, but no. Brother Ellis, he shouted, mate! <laughs> he was the vast Falstaffian mountain of cheer and resolution I'd always known. He proposed lunch in the members' dining room on him. And so it came to pass. We talked of movies, the Middle Ages, the lunacy in Iraq. Eventually I said, do you have a view of Rudd? He gave one of his big sheer misery laughs. Ah, you and I are the last of the warriors, Ellis, he said. This has been a victory for middle management. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said, yes, I see. He's brilliant, he's brilliant. And in this game that doesn't hurt. But in the end, in the end, in the bitter end, he believes in nothing. That's him, that's, speak. that's, that's him that's, speaking, yes, not yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. That's not right, I said. I mean, he, he said to me once, people think I'm a God-botherer, but I'm only a small G God-botherer, really. Which means he believes in nothing, Beasley shouted ebulliently, closing the subject and sitting on the lid. <laughs> we roasted for an hour and a half when Beasley said, I'd better make an appearance in the house, otherwise they'll think I'm sulking. Which I am, he laughed and went. <laughs> yeah, that which I am is very good. <laughs> Uh, you, he, he was your ideal Labor Prime, ideal for a Labor Prime Minister, yes. wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. And why, beyond, beyond what's implicit in that, why? Well, he overcame polio and became a football star. He, um, uh, he loved literature and uh, his favourite book was Cold Mountain. He loved delving into history. He could draw maps of every battle since Neolithic times that was ever fought. He could... <laughs> He could recognise by silhouette every fighter plane that ever flew. And uh, he had a, a great and troubled sort of neo-Catholic conscience about, you know, abortion and, and euthanasia and, and so on. And he, uh, he had a very low opinion of himself and he couldn't believe in any election that he would retain his seat because he thought he didn't deserve to. He was very, very kind to his uh, mentally challenged uh, brother. He... Uh, uh, he, 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 was, he was a wonderful man, and uh, I asked him uh, what was he, the favourite play he ever, uh, favourite performance of a play he ever said, and it was, he said it was Arthur Dignam doing Diary of a Madman in the Hole in the Wall in Perth. And he used to go and watch uh, David Helfgott play and things. He was, he was a man of vast, what Mike Rand calls vast hinterland, you know. Uh, there was much, much more to him than the... Uh, the slightly uh, tedious series of sub-clauses people were allowed to see on television. Yeah, later you say something about his relationship with his father in yes. another piece on yes. this. Well, uh, he left his father's mad religion, uh, moral rearmament, and his father never forgave him. And his father began to regard him as a waste of space. And uh, the, on the worst day of his life... He learned at eight in the morning that his brother had died, concealed it from Caucus, who then voted him out of the leadership. And he got on the plane that afternoon to fly five hours back to the corpse of the brother who loved him and the stern gaze of the father who regarded him as a waste of genes. And I, think of, I can think of no trail of tears longer and sadder than that. Um, Sid Hickman, who was his chief of staff for many years, said that if... If his father had died in 1996 and Mick Young had not died, he would have been Prime Minister in 1998, and I hold that to be true. 
We all fear the disapproval of our fathers beyond most things. And he had to labour not only with the long flight to Perth twice a week and back, but he had to labour with the destination, which was his uh, father's immense and continuing disapproval. You actually speculate in respect of that long flight to Perth that uh, jet lag saw him off as a leader. Yeah. There was a girl who worked for him who said that uh, when he became leader she wouldn't work for him unless he moved to Sydney because that, that loss of a day a week, but the, the loss of two hours of the day, so in effect you had to be up at 5am on a Sunday morning get, getting makeup put on to be uh, interviewed from Sydney on, uh, uh, on the insiders meant that you were never wholly in control of your life or your mind. It is a terrible fact. And it's another part of the tyranny of distance in Australia that uh, most Perth politicians who come to, come to Canberra, first of all, lose their wives, and then they lose office and they lose their minds. Not necessarily in that order. Yes. <laughs> Gillard and Rudd appeared jointly on Meet the Press this morning, looking like Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant on Bringing Up Baby. <laughs> yes. Will you grow warmer to our Prime Minister, do you think, over the years? Not lately, no. Uh, no, I, I wish he would do something other than the obvious. I mean, I, I really resent his recent attack on boat people as the low, lowest of the low... Uh, on uh, people, people smugglers. smugglers. People smugglers, yeah. yeah. I mean, Moses was a people smuggler. Schindler, <laughs> Schindler was a people smuggler. The, those brave men who came in, came in little boats to Dunkirk were... People smugglers. Uh... That is a very Alice observation. <laughs> uh, Moses was a people smuggler. Schindler was a people smuggler. He's talking about something different. He's people, talking about people making money from, from sending uh, hapless, hapless families out on the high seas in uh, leaky vessels. That's and, and themselves serving 25 years selfishly for having done so. They sound like heroes to me. Oh, be careful of that. Be careful <laughs> of that. So your, your, your sentimentality about these things is what worries me. Your vision of socialism, Alice, ah. is that orchestra you saw in Ukraine. You give an account of it here when you've gone to Russia to talk about films. And you go to Ukraine mm. and there's an, a hundred-piece orchestra. Yes, in, a, in an autumn park. And uh, they played, first of all, uh, Mozart and then for balance, Salieri, <laughs> and then Tchaikovsky, of course. And, uh, but you, you, you say in the book that they're, they're there on the public sector payroll um, to, to provide the music for the 100 films made a year yes. in Ukraine. And you imply that that's your vision of socialism. Everyone on the public payroll, dressed a bit like you, um, <coughs> cigarette ash coming down the, yes, yes. the lapel, uh, or food stains in your case, and, and um, working for the government and vast cultural subsidies, keeping, uh, keeping film and, and theatre alive. That, that, to, to be honest, that is the, your vision of, of what our society should be like, isn't it's it? It's my vision of the arts. Uh, with it, the, uh, the Russians gave us the best cinema, the best live theatre, the best orchestras, the best ballet, the best circuses and... Uh, and so on, uh, that the world has seen. I, I, wouldn't, I think uh, it's quite right there should be private grocers and restaurateurs and so on, but the arts, the arts, comrade, the arts <laughs> need protection. Well, we all agree with that. We all agree with that. Um, moving on to John Howard. Yes. Um, <laughs> how, how deep does your feeling about him run? Beasley said that my hatred of Howard was such that it was shriveling my soul and distorting my life and harming my career and I should give it up. And I said, I can't, I can't. <laughs> you know. I, uh, I, I don't I hate anyone <laughs> apart from uh, uh, the, the, the former President George W. Bush mm. um, on, on, yeah. on very well-based grounds. But there, there were flashes of hatred I felt towards Howard on three occasions. One is his stop, stubborn resistance to doing anything about climate change, saying, for example, well, why should we act before the Indians and Chinese? Act? Yes. The second indictment is, is him gratuitously launching an attack on Barack Obama. Yes. Saying that a victory for Obama would be a, a victory for bin Laden. Now, it was a politically illiterate statement. 
mm. was unwise in terms of Australia's national interest. He did it only to get a pat on the head mm. from the Republicans off in Washington. And I thought that, that deserves our contempt especially. And the third one was a mysterious statement he made in the lead up to the last federal election where he said, please, words to this effect, please understand that for someone like me, there's been enormous difficulty in coming to terms with the indigenous issue. Yes. And I wondered what he was talking about. As a, as a 12 year old in Matraville, I knew that the Aborigines at La Perouse were peculiarly disadvantaged and these sand hills had once belonged to them, if not that particular clan, to mm. members of the uh, Aboriginal race, and they'd been, they'd been supplanted by the whites who arrived in 1788. What he meant by that, I, th I find to this day, a mystery, but it made me feel very angry about him. Yeah, I, he seems to have... Um, I think you know what I mean when I say that some people are frozen at a particular age and they grow uh, intellectually and emotionally no older, and I think round about at the age of 11 when, when, he, first, when he first hit pay door, dirt as a schoolboy school orator and a class sneak. He, uh, <laughs> he didn't develop beyond. And uh, I think that the attitudes that he had about the indigenous people in the British Empire and all that persisted. You can uh, help me on this. Uh, I was told, and I put it in the book, that at... Um, uh, Premier's conferences, he refused to have Kyoto mentioned on the agenda and uh, he refused for most of, uh, for all of your term there to discuss the River Murray. Is that so? Uh, it could be. What, what stands out for me though is his anger at being dragged by a campaign I was running to permit embryonic stem cell research. Ah, right. He, yeah, there was just a flash of uh, resentment from him, deep resentment at the, uh, the dinner he hosted with the premiers before a COAG meeting. Um, and he was very reluctant, but he'd been dragged by the, the public campaign, including the attention given to people with spinal diseases and, uh, mm. and, uh, and accidents. And he went from initially opposing allowing embryonic stem cell research mm. to accepting it grudgingly, grudgingly yes. but only as a result of a campaign. And there's a real flash of anger and resentment on his part that that was, that was happening. He was a man who uh, lived with his mother until he was 32, dutifully washing up and going to church with her in the years of her growing madness and widowhood. And then he moved in with a fairly similar woman at the age of 50. <laughs> and it seems to me that the life, the life that we had as students and, uh, you know, and uh, travelling vagrants and journalists and so on was was lost to him and there was a, an amazing um, diminution of, uh, of emotional response in his upbringing that is not common to most humans. Yeah, um, but the, uh, you, you're all automatically going to believe the worst about him mm. and is that true when it comes to the exchange with, that, that you uh, spell out here, the reported exchange between Malcolm Fraser and him in yes. 1976 in the corridors. Yeah, Parliament. yes. Uh, uh, Howard said to Fraser after he was letting the boat people in, he said, this is just a stunt, isn't it? We just do it for a little while and we stop. And, and Fraser said, I did not hear you say this and you did not say it. You know, something to that effect. And your source is good for this story? It was the Sydney Morning Herald. <laughs> um, I, I think... Uh, <laughs> I think a bit more serious confirmation is required. Uh, if uh, the newspapers are rough in history, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald is the roughest of the rough. The Sydney Morning Herald advocated a vote for Labor only once in 160 years, and it was yours. Your government yeah. wasn't. I offered, because I knew their tradition was to have editorials always supporting the Liberals in a state election, I offered in 1999 to write the editorial endorsing <laughs> Kerry Chikorovsky. I thought I could parody the Herald editorial style, and I could do a better job of anyone working in their office, and it could remain a, a precious secret between me and the editor <laughs> until I retired from politics. And what did he say? Uh, he, he, I, I think he thought his reputation was at stake if he <laughs> indulged uh, me in such a, a wild prank. Um, how do you think, do, do you think there might be any revisionism when it comes to how the, down the track, you know, the evil that men do, lives after them, I guess, but in his case, 
it may just be buried. He's hoping that as Labor struggles with this global crisis, that people will forget the sort of shortcomings we've been picking over and say, well, at least there were those, those years of prosperity. I, I'm not sure, but I, I think not, particularly because of the lavish shovels full of money he kept reaping from the GST and, uh, and sending back to the people in, a, in years when he should have been attending to the infrastructure, as Costello has bitterly noted in his travesty of the memoir. Uh, I think that uh, I think that he has too many enemies among his own folk for that to occur. He has few friends left, even among his biographers. How is your interest in in Australian politics? It's a question I could ask of uh, yes. someone like Michelle Grattan. How does your keen interest in the the, the, the world of current affairs, the, mm. the the day in day out political battles, get maintained? I would have thought you're almost at the point where you've seen so much and written so much about it, you just want to devote yourself to, to literature. I think that's coming, uh, but in, in the years that mattered, those terrible 12 years, it was a fear of poverty and a fear of a continuance of a, a grey, dim tyranny that seemed summed up in the personality of Philip Ruddock, you know, which was... Take, taking taking over the nation in a in a in a horrible way. I, I, I can think of I can think of no actual, no actual comparison to it except a, a less colourful North Korea. <laughs> would, would you you wrote that uh, lovely play about uh, about Ben Chifley? Yes, and uh, I hope I hope it gets performed more. You, know, yes. you had a terrific actor yes. to play Chif's part, but you were fundamentally a child of. The Chifley era, aren't you? Yes. And I remember a line before, long before I met you. I remember a line from uh, Newsfront. Yes. We had one of the characters say, one of the characters say, Chifley and Kurt, and they were the best prime ministers we ever had. Yes. That's and right. I thought, whoever the scriptwriter is, mm. he's terrific. He's <laughs> on my side. Yeah. And so it's about 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 John Curtin. You don't get witty. <laughs> one of the characters says. Yes. Mm. Mm.